Welcome everyone to our third um, our third lecture in the Distingu Distinguished Lecture Series with the New York Academy of Sciences Anthropology section. Um, tonight we have the great pleasure of welcoming David Carballo and Timothy um, Pugh to speak with us about ancient cities and what we can learn from their infrastructure that sheds light on contemporary cities today. This is part of our Distinguished Lecture Series um, entitled Emergent Care and Community. In the wake of our turbulent and abiding experiences of pandemic pain and politics, the anthropology section of the New York Academy of Sciences will focus our program this year on the theory and critique of forms of care, mutual aid, and charity. With this theme, we raise questions about possibility and solidarity in the face of entrenched social inequities and racialized structural violence. With this theme, we honor three esteemed colleagues from our New York City community whom we recently lost, David Graber, Sally Engelmary, and Leith Mullings. We invite discussion of how communities develop and deepen forms of care for one another and our environment in times of crisis or under enduring conditions of suffering. How might care be reactive, adaptive, relative, relative or revelatory? How do emergent communities, both on the ground and in virtual spaces, stake claims to a future that expands or contracts in the face of solidarity? This conversation invites discussion of the politics of humanitarian efforts throughout the world in recognition of the reality that much community-based care emerges in the shadow of dysfunctional governance and the corruptions of neoliberalism. The global pandemic has highlighted the irony that care workers are often underpaid or even unpaid, their exploitation a symptom of structural inequalities accrued across generations. Against the centrifugal forces of capitalist modernity, what possibilities exist for radically mutual care in the future? What constitutes care as related to the social, environmental, ontological, or material? Rather than asking anthropologists to assume some kind of prophetic role, this series offers an opportunity to take critical stock of what tools and perspectives our discipline provides in terms of methods, theory, community engagement, and public commentary as we envision and imagine new possibilities for reshaping society. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And I'd like to turn um, the event over now to Matt Riley, who will introduce our speaker and our discussant. Thank you, Stephanie, and welcome everyone to what promises to be a thought-provoking conversation. As Stephanie noted earlier, this year's series is partly a tribute to several influential anthropologists who are no longer with us, one of whom is David Graeber. Graeber's posthumous co-authored book, The Dawn of Everything, is currently making waves, not just in the anthropology world, but within the broader public. One of the incredible contributions of this work, among many others, is to challenge us to reevaluate the questions we ask of human societies in the past and present. I see the same kind of inquisitive and innovative spirit reflected in the work of our speaker this evening, Dr. David Carballo. In the introductory chapter to his 2013 edited volume, Cooperation and Collective Action, Archaeological Perspectives, Dr. Carballo focuses not on the indices of if a society is complex, but the myriad ways of how it can be complex, calling attention to collective labor, self-organization, and community action. All of these social themes are at the heart of our series this year, and we're therefore thrilled to have him joining us tonight. Dr. Carballo is graciously taking a break this evening from his administrative duties as Assistant Provost for General Education at Boston University to share his expertise on pre-Columbian Mesoamerican urbanism. Dr. Carballo, who also holds the title of Professor of Anthropology, Archaeology, and Latin American Studies at BU, is the author of several monographs and edited volumes, including Urbanization and Religion in Ancient Central Mexico, published in 2016, the co-edited Teotihuacan, The World Beyond the City, published in 2020, and his latest monograph, Collision of Worlds, A Deep History of the Fall of Aztec Mexico and the Forging of New Spain, published with Oxford University Press in 2020. He has an impressive resume of peer-reviewed publications in the field's leading journals, including Latin American Antiquity, the Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory, and the Journal of Anthropological Archaeology. His current research has been supported by multiple grants from the National Science Foundation and National Geographic Society, among other prestigious awards. 
In the spirit of community care and collectivism, I also want to point out the fact that the overwhelming majority of Dr. Carballo's publications feature co-authors who are local professionals in Mesoamerican archaeology. Similarly, he is dedicated to public education and outreach, most recently exemplified by a beautifully illustrated comic book designed to get local children interested in heritage and the archaeological past. Following Dr. Carballo's talk and prior to a more open Q&A with our audience, we'll also hear from our discussant, Dr. Tim Pugh. One of our own here at CUNY, Dr. Pugh is Professor of Anthropology at Queens College and Affiliated Faculty in Anthropology at the CUNY Graduate Center. Like Dr. Carballo, Dr. Pugh has long worked in Mesoamerica, where he currently directs the ITSA Archaeological Project in Guatemala. Dr. Pugh has an extensive publication record, including articles in leading journals like Current Anthropology, American Anthropologist, the Journal of Field Archaeology, and Ancient Mesoamerica. Along with Prudence and Don Rice, he is the, also the author of the 2017 volume, Small Things Forgotten, Artifacts of Fishing in the Paten Lakes Region, Guatemala. His primary areas of interest in the Maya world are the middle pre-classic period and the contact and colonial period, the latter of which is the focus of his current book project. His research has received substantial support from the National Science Foundation and PSC CUNY. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. David Carballo for his talk this evening, Urban Infrastructure and Resiliency in Pre-Colonial Mesoamerica. Please join me in welcoming silently, virtually, how we do it now, Dr. David Carballo. Many thanks, Matt, for that introduction um, and the invitation. I'd also like to thank uh, Stephanie Rupp for the invitation and Baird Campbell for his support and publicity and Tim Pugh for agreeing to uh, provide comments and uh, help the discussion at the, at the end of the talk. Um, and also, yeah, thanks to all of you for logging on and, um, and I'm interested in, in the discussion this provokes, thinking about infrastructure, which of course is something uh, that is, is timely and something that's part of our, our political discussions these days. Um, and so what I wanted to do today was to zoom out and in uh, to consider cities more generally, ancient ones more particularly, comparisons between those of Mesoamerica and Teotihuacan, the city that you see here rendered in CGI outside of Mexico City most specifically. So, um, of course, urban infrastructure or infrastructure in general is one of the, the topics that is part of political discourse this, these days. And we're having discussions about what constitutes fundamental infrastructure, um, what the fiscal finance structure should look like, what should be supported. Um, oftentimes, unfortunately, it seems like a lot of the discussion is about who uh, in the media about who, who may or may not vote for a particular bill or how large it is rather than what's in it and what would it provide for cities or for uh, you know, linking um, rural areas to cities. So maybe we can think about that a little bit. Um, and here, uh, some of my, um, uh, the classifications that you see here are inspired by urban theorists such as Eric Kleinenberg uh, and others that you see cited below of drawing distinctions um, between hard infrastructure, green infrastructure, and social infrastructure. And I should note that those, of course, are, are just heuristic categories for organizing our thought. They, of course, overlap with one another. But when we think about hard infrastructure, we can think about things like in the Build Back Better plan of roads and bridges and transportation or sewer networks or that sort of thing. Um, with green infrastructure, uh, uh, we're thinking about um, ways of building resilience into urban systems. Uh, and um, uh, Kleinenberg actually had an interesting article in, in the New Yorker a month or two ago that was talking about uh, replanting oyster beds in New York Harbor as a way of mitigating storm surges like with Hurricane Sandy. So that's a way of thinking about how, how you could green your infrastructure. Um, and then what probably most has interested me in terms of thinking archeologically about this are, is social infrastructure. Um, and I think that articulates with the, uh, the theme here um, it, for this uh, uh, um, year's events uh, in that, you know, something that Kleinerberg highlights is in social infrastructure are places where neighbors get together and generally enjoy themselves. And it's a way of building more resilient communities. So places like 
parks or uh, libraries. Um, and that, that's where neighbors tend to then care for each other and look out for one another um, as a way of building more resilient neighborhoods and, and communities. Um, and so we can also, again, these are not hard and fast categories. We can think of examples where uh, one can run into another. Um, when I was you know, uh, last in, in New York, I, I walked along the High Line, which of course is hard infrastructure that has been repurposed as social infrastructure, or even has elements of green infrastructure. But there are just ways of thinking about, about types of infrastructure. So um, here uh, I'm drawing on a recent publication that I have impressed with, with two colleagues, Gary Feynman and Aurelio Lopez, um, and, and one or both of them are on this call and they've agreed to field any of the hard questions. So uh, you can direct them right to, to those two. Um, but here you're looking at Mesoamerica. Of course, Mesoamerica is much of today's Mexico and, and much of uh, Central America. And you can see divisions here between the highlands, which are light green and, and brownish versus the lowlands as a way of classifying them. Um, but there are also quite a, a, a range of diversity in, in ethno-linguistic groups of Mesoamerica and cities. So uh, to the right, you see the city of Copan. That's where I began my career. Uh, and uh, that's a classic Maya city in, in Western Honduras. Um, and here, you're, the urban infrastructure uh, served to foreground the ruling dynasty. Those uh, carved stela are uh, depicting kings uh, who are seen as divine kings. and um, there are life histories in hieroglyphic texts behind them. There are um, uh, uh, dynastic temples. The longest text in the Americas is, is known as a hieroglyphic stairway in the pre-colonial Americas, um, and that's recounting dynastic history. Um, so that, that's a model of a, a classic Maya city. Um, then you also see at the bottom, those of you who've traveled to Oaxaca maybe have been here, in southern Mexico, uh, the hilltop city of Monte Alban. And, and um, uh, what you're looking at in the center is the reconstructed archeological core that has um, you know, uh, ceremonial and palatial complexes, but winding all around the hills are terraces where, where folks lived. Um, and so this is a, a type of city in, in the highlands in particular. Um, and uh, then, and also much more nucleated, I should say, uh, an, an urban arrangement. And then on the top left is Teotihuacan, uh, an imperial capital built on a really uh, large scale to impress um, and, and clearly articulating things about the political religious order, but not indexing specific dynasts. And that's a, a, a difference that we see in, in Teotihuacan in particular. Um, and one of the reasons actually it's, it makes it as a case into Graeber and, and Wengro's recent book. So for this study, there's a sample of 35 cases, which are actually 29 different cities, but some of these cities were abandoned for centuries and then reoccupied and um, looked very different in many cases from the previous one. And so we coded those as two different um, instances of urbanism. So um, we're fortunate in Mesoamerica to have some detailed texts, especially from the early colonial period. Um, and so uh, where, where I work in central Mexico, Nahuatl was the lingua franca of the former Aztec empire. And uh, there's quite a, a lot of literature written um, in, in, in bilingual in, in Nahuatl and Spanish. And so um, we can use those as an entry point into different social institutions, the way that cities were organized and then uh, houses were organized. And then I think most importantly, and what I've sort of really focused on uh, most recently are those intermediate social groupings that mediated between households and the state or the city or the you know sort of larger political entity. Um, and here we see some differences. So uh, for instance, organization into districts, the Kampan, that's a, a, the term for, for district organization within a city state. Um, and I think a really key distinction is in the uh, form of organization in Nahuatl known as the Kalpoli or the big house, literally, versus the Tekali or the Lord's house. And these were two social organizations that, that um, could coexist in Nawa society. Um, but they're at different points or different you know, cities and in different uh, points in history, one seemed to be more powerful than the other. Or I should say that the Kalpuli could, was able to keep the hierarchical tendencies of Tekali organization more in check, that intermediate social organization could be more powerful and be a buffer 
against this more patron client uh, type system. But both existed in the Aztec world, and, th and I think they're good models for thinking about variability in Mesoamerica more broadly. Um, then we also have the Calpolco, which are, are uh, distinctive spots of built architecture, urban infrastructure of neighborhood centers that contain things like um, a, you know, the neighborhood temple and plaza and sometimes ball court or market and the schools. There is compulsory education uh, in Aztec societies. And so these are some of the, the examples of, of um, neighborhood social infrastructure. Um, on the right, you see images of house arrangements in different Mesoamerican societies, and you can see uh, how uh, wide they can vary. So um, from sort of smaller houses that you see on the, the bottom that might be organized around a patio um, to uh, uh, agglutinative houses uh, like compounds that you see at Tula, which is a Toltec capital, to then the Teotihuacan apartment compounds, which I'll talk about in, in much more detail later. Um, versus the complexes actually where I began uh, excavating in Copan was a, a, a residential complex that really was based on a, like a more Lord's house model. So this um, patron client system, that up inverted U shaped building they see on the bottom, that is where the Lord would live. And then other family members and retainers lived in, in smaller houses. So you see the hierarchy within uh, this house structure. Um, I think really central to understanding this variability in urban organization and socio-political organization uh, are resources and the iterative processes by which uh, social groups, especially this, this intermediate scale, the super household, but not as large as a state or a city uh, type social groups managed resources, and then how those articulated as part of fiscal systems, underwriting the political economies of cities, states, or empires. Um, and so here, uh, drawing on the work of, of Lynn Ostrom and colleagues, um, this is a, an earlier article with, with Feynman where we considered range of goods um, and, and asked questions like, so you know, this is based on the indices that uh, um, economists like Ostrom and, and um, political scientists and other social scientists use, how difficult or easy is it to exclude others from the benefit of a particular resource? And how does the use of a particular resource impact the ability of others to access that same resource? That's what the axes of exclusion and subtractability are. And here I've filled in some examples based on Mesoamerica, which aren't specific to every world region, but there are certain things that you can see, like for instance, common pool resources. There's been a, you know, a very robust literature on these, uh, they're things that uh, subtractability is high. So if people fish too much or forest, or, you know, cut down trees too much, um, then uh, um, those resources uh, are gone. And that's different than say the public good of urban infrastructure, like a fortification. A fortification around a city um, protects all the inhabitants irrespective of whether they contributed to the labor or not. So um, that makes uh, exclusion difficult and subtractability lower, relatively speaking. I put a lot of arrows here so you get the sense that you know, these grade into each other. And again, they're not hard and fast. Um, then uh, if, you know, the realm of private goods tends to be smaller scale, more households in general. Um, in Mesoamerica, there's a lot of um, communal land tenure among uh, um, the intermediate social organizations like the Kalpuli, uh, but then um, residences like living in apartments, sharing terraces, the image that you see on the top left is an example of uh, you know, uh, um, co co um, cooperating households uh, that were working not just to build terraces, but then also to maintain terraces. And, and so there are many ethnographic examples of this, of course, um, but um, if any neighbor is uh, not maintaining their terrace, it, it impacts all of their neighbors as well, because it, it, it leads to erosion. So um, these are the sorts of collective action resource dilemmas I think are important for thinking about in any particular, uh, you know, either contemporary or past setting of what structures uh, sociopolitical organization. I promise that this is the only slide that will have such small text and so many numbers, but um, these are just some of the results of uh, the work with Feynman and, um, and Lopez. Uh, uh, where we, we see strong correlations between the variables that we coded for in Mesoamerica. Um, and so these are strong at the 95% confidence interval that social scientists 
uh, tend to, to like as having explanatory value. Um, and so the ones that are in the brightest yellow, you can see have to do with longevity. Uh, and longevity there we defined as um, years at, at, at close to apogee population. And we were trying to get something that was like say 50% of apogee population, but the survey data just aren't good enough to be able to say that definitively. But so what sort, how many centuries was a city a powerful, significant city within its, its particular region. That, that's what we were um, looking at in terms of, of longevity. So those that were more collective, that had more shared neighborhood infrastructure, and that were denser, tended to last longer uh, in Mesoamerica. Then we see other elements of the built environment, like the social infrastructure, um, the uh, shared terraces and walls, making for more collective uh, socio-political organization in those particular uh, polities, um, and uh, in, in other cases, um, density, actually. So density seems to be important. It's denser cities, neighbors are bumping up uh, um, against each other more. There's probably more collective action dilemmas to try to resolve and uh, to find solutions for. Um, there's, you see one negative correlation there. That's the population to plaza ratio. So we actually you know, had the idea that cities with really large plazas should on the whole be more collective because they're making a space for a lot of people um, to you know, come in for collective rituals. But what we saw is actually the inverse. They tend to uh, be less collective um, and they have less neighborhood social infrastructure because those tend to be cities that have these large plazas uh, probably like a place like Copan, although I can get into uh, variability there. Um, but where uh, the, uh, the, the emphasis is on this you know, dynastic uh, um, uh, political spectacle. Um, and so uh, it's more about this, this, um, this political signaling within those large plazas. Um, now I should say that you know, there, what we see in our study is that there's not sort of any hard and fast cultural differences. These, you know, within any culture region, there's variability. Um, so if, for instance, in the Maya lowlands, there's really interesting variability between the Northern lowlands, cities like Tunchuch Mil, uh, where, where um, Scott Hudson and other colleagues have worked um, versus the, the Southern lowland cities. And then over time, so Tim uh, will talk later about differences between the pre-classic and, and classic and perhaps post-classic organization in the Maya uh, lowlands. Likewise, where I work in central Mexico, there's quite, quite a difference between the classic period and the subsequent epi-classic period. So, so you know, this is more historically oriented. It's, it has to do with those collective action dilemmas and the fiscal structures rather than any sort of hard cultural templates. Okay, so now just to, to um, dig down into a particular city, we'll look at Teotihuacan, um, which was the largest city in the Western hemisphere um, about 2000 to 1500 years ago. And so it was a really big place starting about 100 BCE to about 550, 600 uh, common era. And we know a lot about Teotihuacan or we even get the name Teotihuacan and names for some of the monuments from the later Aztecs. So the Aztecs came to this region about a thousand years later, their, their you know, apogee was, was around a thousand years later. Um, and this was a, a, um, a, a highly significant place that's seen as the place uh, where the, uh, the fifth son of creation was set into motion. Um, and um, the, you know, the Aztecs saw it as a place of cosmogenesis, but at the same time also likely knew as a place that humans occupied because they excavated there. They, uh, they knew there was a material culture that wasn't so different from, from their own. On the bottom left, you see a famous Teotihuacan mask, but what, what's on top of it is an overlay by Aztec Mixtec artisans um, with turquoise and spondylus shell. And I love this because it's this visual metaphor of you know, building on a predecessor civilization, just like the Aztecs were doing uh, with Teotihuacan. But so in the, in the, the um, really important um, narrative of cosmogenesis known as the land of the Solis or the fifth sun, uh, a very humble God, not a one scene, whose name literally means um, uh, full of sores, uh, sacrifices himself for the good of humanity and becomes the sun. And so it's also interesting that there's a story of, of humbleness. The humble God is the one that becomes uh, you know, the most powerful thing in the sky. So in thinking about uh, Teotihuacan is an urban place. 
we often hear a lot about its, its population. Yes, it was big, over 100,000 uh, occupants. It, or its pyramids, uh, they were large, but a lot of places had large populations. A lot of places had pyramids and a lot of places had grid plans. Um, as Tim will show later, Teotihuacan wasn't the first place in Mesoamerica to have a grid plan. And so, so um, and, and of course we have old world examples or Eurasian examples. Uh, here you're looking at Alexandria. Um, and so, um, there's you know uh, been discussion. We could get into this in the in the Q and A too about how democratic or inclusive versus autocratic and social controlling grid organization uh, is uh, in 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 cities or uh, historical cities or ancient cities. But you know what it really is most impressive about Teotihuacan is the fact that almost all of its residents lived in multifamily apartment compounds. So here, um, Teotihuacan was a contemporary of Imperial Rome, and here they are drawn to scale. Um, they see the, the shared scale bar. Rome was much larger in population, and partially that's because it had multi-story residences, like the insulae, which were the apartment compounds of, of Rome that you see on bottom left. Um, but only about 25% of the city's residents lived in, in these apartments. Um, compared to at least 90, 95%, we don't know for sure because the more sort of perishable houses we can't see archeologically uh, in Teotihuacan, but the vast majority of Teotihuacanos resided in these multifamily apartment compounds. And unlike the insulae of Rome, which were um, largely lower status residents um, and for renters and, and the upper floors uh, were subject to fires and so were dangerous places to live, the apartment compounds of Teotihuacan were relatively nice, painted with frescoes or murals, um, it had drainage systems, and, and, and were overall pretty sanitary. So that's what's really drawn my attention um, as part of the city, although I've worked in other contexts as well. Um, the city also seems to have had a more muted or dampened uh, uh, form of um, social inequality. And so there, this has seen a lot of work um, through uh, colleagues in archaeology trying to compare levels of socio-political inequality or socioeconomic inequality through um, calculations of, of the Gini coefficient that economists and political scientists use um, using such variables as living space or mortuary furnishings. To the right is also um, uh, some coding that I did of, uh, of skeletal stature, all things being equal, uh, you know, um, if there's greater inequality, elites have better diet and better health outcomes. And you can see by and large um, in, in both these sorts of analyses that uh, populations in the Americas had less inequality than populations in, in Eurasia. Um, and now there's a lot of reasons why this could be and some possibilities include differences in land technology uh, and labor. Um, so for instance, in uh, in Eurasia, there were traction animals that didn't exist uh, in the Americas, and so that allowed for plow agriculture that also allowed for um, more extensive land holdings that some social elites could monopolize uh, or, or disproportionately control. Also key spot resources, uh, military technologies, so the sort of the ramp up in military technology of cavalry of the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, um, et cetera, are, were all um, areas where uh, um, aspiring elites could disproportionately control resources and drive greater inequality. Um, and so here you see circled Teotihuacan with its extremely low calculation of a, a Gini coefficient. And, and uh, my colleague, Mike Smith, I know is, is revising this. He thinks it's probably a, a little higher, but still relatively low compared to a place like Pompeii as a Roman case that you see circled in blue on the top. So some of this might have to do or is, you know, um, a correlation with having this dense living of shared residential space. And so the apartment compounds in, in Teotihuacan could vary. They, they, you know, the smallest ones maybe were only a couple dozen people, up to as many as 200 people residing in shared, uh, um, the, uh, shared spaces that were, that were encircled um, with, uh, with bounding walls, an average probably about 60 or so. Uh, in your average compound. And there's 2,000 to 2,300 of these that are visible archeologically when the, the city was mapped 
Um, so that gives us some good population estimates. They're organized into neighborhoods and districts. And here it's always tempting to draw on the later Aztecs, the term like Kampan and, and institutions like the Kalpuli. But we have to remember, we don't even know if Teotihuacan spoke Nahuatl, if they thought about things the same way. Um, but, um, and it was a thousand years later. Nevertheless, you know, we have to uh, use those sources and use them critically. Um, we know that uh, families within apartment compounds specialized in different forms of craft production. There was a really high percentage of migrants basically throughout the city everywhere that's been excavated and sampled for bone isotope analyses or other ways of, of trying to get at uh, multi-ethnic populations. So, you know, by looking at the floor plans of these, we can guess how much living space was there uh, for, for different families and what might have been a lower status versus an intermediate status house. We also see that, you know, they had an origin. They, again, I, they were unique for Mesoamerica. They're probably, you know, unique for the, the pre-modern world, at least in, in a city of this size being the dominant housing for, for as much as 90 or more percent of the population. But they have some elements that existed prior to the city. And I've also worked on the formative period that comes before Teotihuacan and we see um, arrangements of houses around a patio, a patio group, and we see orthogonal uh, house arrangements um, that, you know, essentially, if you, if, you, if you put those together and scale them up, you would get something like a Teotihuacan compound. We also see that there's the, the, the principle of spatial replication that urban historian Spiro Kostov talks about, where the apartment compounds have you know, rooms around a courtyard. This is all schematic, of course, but that leads to neighborhood organization around a you know, central plaza or neighborhood center uh, that scales up to the, the level of the city. Now, some of my colleagues, particularly um, the uh, archaeologists Ruben Cabrera and Sergio Gomez, who worked in La Ventilla, and Linda Manzanilla and team, who worked in Teopan Casco, have documented extensively neighborhood centers uh, um, at a few different districts of the city, um, uh, to the southwest, La Ventilla, and to the southeast, Teopan Casco. Tahinga is what I'm going to talk about to the south. That's where we've been working. But you can see some other areas where there were these ethnic enclaves um, where people came, the Zapotec populations came from Oaxaca to the west of the city. There are also um, West Mexican populations there. Maya communities that we see in, sprinkled throughout different parts of the city, but a little more um, in the center um, west. And then uh, inhabitants of the Gulf of Mexico um, in what's known as the Merchant's Barrio. So here's Tlahinga and um, some of my colleagues here from the National Autonomous University, UNAM uh, of Mexico, and, and, uh, and uh, some of my students, Daniela Hernandez, who I see logged in here. She's uh, busy drawing um, a floor in this particular illustration. Um, and the arrows show the different places I've worked in Teotihuacan. Um, and so I started working in the, the Moon Pyramid, a temple complex. I've also worked in Plaza of the, of the Columns, which is a palatial complex. So that gives you an idea of the, the socio-political um, apex of the city. But Tlahinga is something very different. Um, and so I could uh, compare it here for a New York audience, a little to the Lower East Side, uh, of, as a place that you know was um, working class and um, uh, had a high migrant po uh, immigrant population. Um, my father uh, uh, was born in, in one of these tenements on, on Water Street. This, of course, is a tenement museum. Uh, so I feel like I have some roots here, um, and uh, I like to think about Tlahinga, you know, in this in sort of analogy. Um, there was a previous project done at Tlahinga by a Penn State team. Uh, by Dolph Widmer and Rebecca Story uh, in 7980, and they excavated one apartment compound of some 90 or so that are in the square kilometer uh, district um, known as, as 33. And they documented uh, the inhabitants of Tlinga 33 to, to have been potters, and they specialized in a very utilitarian but nicely made ware. So this was a, a very functional ware for cooking and food storage. And um, you can see uh, the, uh, the wasters and the, the, the uh, tools for polishing the clay on the top right. So where we excavated, it was more in the center east of the district. Um, and um, you can see uh, here are some of the excavations in progress in, in two different seasons and how far we are from the pyramids, which are like, uh, you know, give you an indication of, of how far away the skyline was um, for that time. So another analogy to draw here with 
with, uh, with New York is the laying out of the central artery of Teotihuacan. So it's known as the Street of the Dead. That's again, a Nahuatl term, uh, Mikaotli that you know, came from the later Aztecs. Uh, we don't know what the Teotihuacanos called it, but it is the central artery of the city. And um, I like to think about, you know, so what are the, the um, possible, uh, um, you know, top down or bottom up, more centralized, more localized forms of planning that went into uh, uh, this, this um, urban spine for these cities. So, you know, of course, in New York, uh, Broadway began as a Lenape uh, footpath through, uh, the, uh, through Manhattan. Um, that then became consolidated by the Dutch in, in New Amsterdam, and they'd go grazing their cattle outside of the walls of Wall Street. Um, and then, and so, you know, more organic processes that, you know, became a, a little more planned and then highly planned with the 1811 uh, commissioner's plan of, of laying out a grid. Um, and uh, that was um, aided by, by markers like this on the left, uh, that's from the, the uh, New York Historical Society surveyor's marker, from 4th Ave and 26th Street. Um, at Teotihuacan, we have something not perfectly uh, analogous, but we have these things called pecked crosses and um, which are oriented to the city's grid plan. Many of them are at least, and, and some of them spanning the east-west east extremes of the city or even beyond that. Um, and these have calendrical and astronomical significance. They're usually 260 uh, dots, which is the, the ritual calendar in Mesoamerica. Um, and, uh, and so it goes beyond just urban planning, it's tying urban planning into calendrical cycles. So how can we see that, you know, maybe some of these same processes like for Broadway were uh, afoot in Teotihuacan? Well, you know, we see it first in the central part of the city in Teotihuacan where tourists walk, you see these, you know, very elaborate temples and uh, that are nicely reconstructed by archeologists and, and they hew to the, to the line of the street nicely. It's not like that in Tlhinga. So in Tlhinga, we what we have is a huge cut, like a massive trench um, in the volcanic tuff substrate, which is known as Tepetate. Um, and it was lowered by a meter, 40 meters wide. And we've documented at least a kilometer, maybe two. So it was a major excavation project for doing that that would have required a significant investment of labor. But then we see the infilling of that central artery um, as a more localized process. So uh, people built their apartment compounds with these sort of crude retaining walls, like you see on the top right, and their, their structures were offset from one another. Again, this is Kostoff's image of like, what, what's the ideal type and, and, and you know, how do people um, more capriciously fill in space if it's a more organic process. And so we do see that at Tlahinga. Um, so for instance, when you see 17 and 18, how they're offset in this map uh, from that image. So um, we've excavated in a few different areas. These were the residential excavations, including along uh, the Street of the Dead. And we were really fortunate in one area. Um, so one difficult thing about Teotihuacan is to, is to dig deep because um, you hit so much architecture and, uh, and, and, and you know, there are ethical issues with dismantling the architecture to then get to lower areas. But where we were here, there was no sort of real formal architecture. There were some adobe and earthen floors. And so we, we were able to excavate a window into them down to the um, sterile substrate and document a, a, a much earlier occupation that shows us a transition from wattle and daub type houses. Like you see on the left, the post holes with the stamped tepetate floor and the transition to apartments uh, in later layers, if it, I, you can maybe make out a brick, adobe brick that's part of a wall from the apartment compound in a later phase over here. Um, and we have a, a range of dates here, so we can sort of track that, um, that shift, at least in this particular periphery part of the city, uh, closely. So that sometime between 300 and 350 AD, there was this switch to apartment living. That was also um, accompanied by changes in the way ways people even cooked. And so in, in the earlier occupation, there were, were hearths, um, but hearths, of course, would have produced a lot of smoke that were getting in your neighbor's apartments in an apartment compound. And so uh, people seem to have adapted by um, cooking outside and then heating food up in these, these stoves. These ceramic stoves are a, a technological adaptation uh, to apartment living. One of the compounds we worked at was also a um, obsidian workers compound. So 
I mentioned earlier that, that there's a lot of craft production in apartment compounds and archeologists are always prone to making some corny jokes. And, uh, and so I'm no exception here. So all archeologists can say that we do groundbreaking research, but um, only those who study lithic stone tools also are doing cutting edge research. And here you see some of my colleagues, this is Penn State, uh, a crew uh, with Ken Hirth, um, leading students in the classification of the many hundreds of kilograms of obsidian that we extracted from this really relatively small excavation. Um, and so within this compound, we have different deposits, including these obsidian cores that were used for making the utilitarian cutting tool of Teotihuacan, the, the uh, prismatic obsidian blade. And over here, these are where our excavations were. And when we did some core sampling, we saw we didn't even hit the most dense deposit. This is really a massive compound um, of, of 100 meters on a side, and it's just ex exceedingly dense with obsidian. So we also can see that, um, that folks in, in this particular compound, 17, were teaching the craft within the family or within the apartment compound at least. So, so for instance, technologically, we can see huge differences between the highly expert core that you see like to the right and the really shoddy job on the left or the really nicely done point uh, in the left image uh, on the right versus um, ones that are you know, making errors and someone who's just learning. Um, we put this in the, the zine that we recently produced and here I loved seeing a reference in Nahuatl. So, um, it's something you know similar to the English saying "chip off the old block." In Nahuatl, the Aztecs uh, would say that you know that uh, the offspring were like an obsidian flake from the family. Um, so I think that was appropriate for this particular group. Um, and so, uh, being obsidian producers, then linked the folks from this compound in Tlahinga into an interregional economy that saw goods moving you know between from the Pacific Ocean up into the highlands. Uh, and then, um, and, and from the Gulf of Mexico as well, and it was connecting uh, different parts of Mesoamerica, and they had access to these resources. The, another compound where we worked, we were, um, with some of the excavations, the largest block were in a central patio, and central patios are often places for uh, group ritual um, within the, the super family household, and that seems to have been the case over here. We have this deposit um, of uh, a, a termination deposit, and so um, in Mesoamerica, uh, before as today, with indigenous peoples, um, the uh, buildings are seen as, as animate, as, as, as being tended to, as being fed, as being consecrated and being terminated. And this deposit is, uh, seems to be a termination deposit at the end of the occupation of this particular compound where um, uh, pots were, were ritually smashed on the ground. They left uh, maize gr grinding tools that you might be able to see on top left, the smoothers for, for covering plaster um, of, of the structures, um, and then also this wonderful mask. And uh, the mask is, um, is you know, was, was very important in, in seeing that what we think of as, as you know, the probably bottom quartile socioeconomically of Teotihuacan of society had access to these things that we think of as luxury objects typically. So we can see that apartment compounds developed out of an earlier rural setting and, and changed the urban patterns in Teotihuacan. We also know that there was migration uh, based on bone isotopes. Gina Buckley uh, is a former Penn State student who just uh, um, recently uh, received her PhD and it documented some 45% of um, the, the uh, um, uh, remains there seem to be from West Mexico, like uh, where is today uh, Michoacan in, in, in Mexico. Um, there's utilitarian production, but no, with, with evidence of apprenticeship, but not some sort of state or political elite sponsorship. Uh, and that there's a wide range of, of uh, resources available as part of a, a more commercialized economy. So the next place that we, we started excavating, and this was after then consulting with community members of um, San Pedro Tlahenga, the local community uh, of, you know, okay, now we've done this, what would be interesting next to, to excavate? And so, so these buildings are, are part of the neighborhood center. Um, and so these, this would be the, the social infrastructure of Tlahenga. And so, so thinking back to, to what, what Kleinenberg talked about, places that we would think you know, community life happens where people come together um, and generally enjoy themselves or, 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 or engage in group activities. And so in that comparative study, we do see that um, th uh, 
Mesoamerican cities with more social infrastructure also tend to have more um, collective socio-political organization. So less ostentatious rule, more sort of uh, even um, distribution of goods or lower indices of social inequality. So here, um, excavations uh, uh, were at, at two different uh, compounds. Um, and uh, these complexes were unlike the apartment compounds that we had seen previously. They were much more elaborately made. Um, they were covered in stucco. They featured a lot of imported goods um, and, and were much more elaborate um, and included murals, which I'll, I'll come to in a second. But um, we did chemical analyses. The team from UNAM, uh, Agustin Ortiz and Luis Barba and team um, uh, did chemical analyses of floors here. And I, I, I won't get too much into the details, but the sort of take home point here is that none of them seem consistent with these having been residences, at least where we excavated. Now, folks, you know, high, um, intermediate elites, barrio elites could have lived in these compounds, but not exactly where we, we excavated. These seem more to have been places for, for uh, perhaps group rituals or other or community activities rather than uh, residences. This second compound over here also featured um, murals uh, and um, deposits that are imported goods from, again, from the Pacific to the, the Gulf and from uh, uh, different regions of Mesoamerica on the bottom left. Um, those are, are magnetite beads, which is a, not a good that you find much, and, and pyrite beads that are more decomposed yellow. Um, these, these aren't resources that, that you find much at Teotihuacan, actually. And so, you know, this southern periphery having access to these resources was quite telling and actually quite unexpected for us. Um, so over here on the left, we have pottery from Oaxaca also and, uh, and other resources. But so these murals were really interesting and unexpected. So some of them were still adhering to walls uh, and others, the, the pieces had fallen and that sort of slowed excavations as we were, were documenting them um, and, and the different themes. And um, uh, we haven't actually been able to go back and do a really systematic analysis because this was 2019 summer season and then the planned lab season uh, hasn't happened yet uh, through the pandemic, but we hope to get back there. But some of the themes are birds and butterflies and flowers and they um, really speak to themes that we know from later uh, Aztec uh, thought um, and other themes that we know in Teotihuacan. So in the uh, uh, image on the left, that line illustration that you have on the bottom right, there's images like that. And these are ones that were found um, actually from the Sun Pyramid. And so we have them way out on the, the periphery of the city. Um, and they seem to relate to uh, themes of um, warfare and uh, um, the, the flowery afterlife in, um, for those who fought bravely in battle. So we know for the Mexica Aztecs, warriors who died in battle and women who died in childbirth had this different afterlife, um, like uh, reincarnated as butterflies, uh, sipping nectar from flowers and a, a sort of beautiful uh, afterworld. Um, and so we seem to have these really high level cosmological themes um, way out on, on, on this urban fringe as well. So um, even though we're two kilometers from the city center, very elaborate structures as part of the social infrastructure uh, of, of this particular city, um, access to uh, resources from all different parts of Mesoamerica. Um, again, even though you know, we don't have direct evidence of these being residences, local elites who organized the barrio or the neighborhood uh, might have lived nearby. That would make sense with what we know of other parts of the city. Um, but uh, you know, as a whole, this is, speaks to an urban organization of public spaces that were distributed throughout the city um, and more accessible social infrastructure. So just zooming back out now to those comparative themes. Um, so when we look at these positive correlations and where Teotihuacan sits in them, on the left, you're looking at housing types. And so we coded um, cities with isolated houses. We actually had none of those in our sample. That's you know, a more rural pattern. But it is typical to have patio groups, like three or four structures uh, around a central patio. 
Um, then we have these more orthogonal house compounds, which have attached houses. And then we have these multifamily apartment compounds. Teotihuacan, of course, is the only example there. So the only one that registers as a four, but this is a clear positive correlation that you know, is statistically significant. Likewise, those spaces that we um, uh, uh, deemed collective, we coded as collective based on a few different variables like differences in burial, the centrality of palaces and how conspicuous rulership was, um, then uh, uh, we see also um, that uh, these, these cities will tend to be denser and also tend to be longer lived and where Teotihuacan fits in that particular correlation. So just to wrap up here, this work is on an ancient city, but of course it's in a contemporary context and one uh, that uh, is on the outskirts of uh, the largest or one of the two largest uh, cities of the Americas today, Mexico City. And you see the image on the left uh, with growth of, of that city over time. Um, of course, starting as the Aztec imperial capital, Tenochtitlan, through the colonial period and the Republican period, and then more recently, real boom in the 20th century. Um, and so this stops at 2000, but you know the, the um, urbanization of the landscape creeping into the Teotihuacan Valley continues. Um, and so that means uh, there is the protected zone around the pyramids that tourists visit, but there's a lot of the city uh, that's being lost to um, modern urbanization as being on the peri-urban fringe uh, of uh, Mexico City today. So we think it's really important then to, to get involved with communities in the area to understand their needs and interests. And um, of course, on the ground, uh, we, you understand the interest in, in growing your family and, and, and building new buildings um, in, in, in this area. Um, and so just trying to work with communities on, on, on understanding and, and, um, uh, um, and, and what priorities they have, working with, with local youth in particular. And so, um, and, and uh, uh, the zine that um, Matt mentioned, you can download it at the, the project webpage. The link is over there. Uh, there's uh, Daniela, uh, um, in, in one of our school visits, um, just connecting uh, with, with students and, and, um, and, uh, and, and showing them that they can be part of the co-creation of knowledge and the, and, um, and, uh, the co-conservation of this urban periphery and that there's interesting stuff coming out of that that tells us how normal Teotihuacan has actually lived and how this city was structured. So that is all I have for now and I look forward to Tim's comments and then and some discussion. Thanks a lot, David. That was a great, great talk. It's going to be hard to follow that up. Um, I have to thank David, not just for this talk, but also uh, David and his colleagues for the contributions they've made to, you know, not just Teotihuacan, but ongoing theories of collective organization in ancient societies, which are helping us to create a more nuanced uh, portrayal of ancient uh, political systems. Um, and, and what I want to try to do here is simply add another example of the social infrastructure. Um, and what I'm gonna do is, is show um, some images from Nishtun Cheech and Pretend Guatemala. So let me bring that up. Okay, but first let me let me introduce my uh, my project here. Um, these are the people that, that do most of the hard work. Um, we, we work, our, our project involves uh, both the United States and, uh, and, uh, and people from Guatemala as well, and actually from Japan as too. Um, and we, um, this, this is our last sort of big uh, field. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the information I'll talk about is from 2019, although we did get some work done this year, but it was, uh, we had to stop several times because of the, the pandemic. Okay, so uh, many myths throughout the world explain aspects of social complexity, in other words, complex societies like states and so on is things such as domestication or even the emergence of cities as being the work of the gods. You know, gods created domesticated plants, they created cities and so on. Some archaeologists do the same thing, but they do it with kings. Kings do everything. They, they, they create, they essentially create the organization that allows things to work together. They, they created um, craft specialization. They created this, they created that. Um, so essentially what, they, what what's going on here is they're simplifying what is actually a very complex process. In other words, they're they're making what's legible something very legible that's not that's not very legible. You know, because well, we have to remember that complexity by definition refers to a number of units interlaced into a single system, not a singular entity. So it, you know, 
kingship or monarchs, um, that, that doesn't account for governance, it, you know, all of the various units um, working together. What, what binds complex societies together is cooperation, not a self-serving quest for status. This is another thing that we, we, we frequently hear is that these, these rulers, the reason that we have the development of inequality um, and complexity is because people strive you know, selfishly to, to make themselves more important, which you know, I don't doubt that happens on occasion, but, but I think that we know from recent uh, leadership in this, this country that that is not really a strong basis for leadership. There are other ways to, to, to lead um, that are a bit better. Now, with respect to public goods, um, you know, including the social infrastructure, um, we have a, another problem that's sort of related to what I was just mentioning with, with Kings. Um, whenever archaeologists encounter th things such as hydraulic systems, defensive systems, or even monuments, the convenient one-liner is that they were developed to add to the status of the ruler. Okay, even if there's no evidence of a ruler, of a despotic ruler, they still say that. They, 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 they don't need the mon monarch there because they were developed to add to the status of this invisible ruler. Um, and I think that one question that that David and his colleagues are helped to answer is just just how effective is such rulership? I mean, if it did exist in that way, um, and again, you know, thinking about recent history, um, societies that are ruled by despots, it's it's not a very effective way, way to rule, and it it's much less resilient. Okay, now of course, ancient leaders certainly existed, um, but what do effective leaders do? They coordinate. Um, with with respect to ancient cities they don't simply build things to add to their own status. <laughs> they build things to create livable cities. And I think that that's some of what um, David is getting to. And that's, that's what modern city planners do. They don't plan to add to their own status. And I, I don't know why this archeologically has to be sort of the, the typical one-liner. And one aspect of successful cities is quality of place, um, which draws populations into cities um, and intensifies social interaction. So instead of obsessing over their own status, ancient planners were like, more likely wringing their hands over infrastructural issues, just like modern planners do, including the social infrastructure. Now, have we had found ancient le leader, images of ancient leaders uh, wringing their hands at Nishtun Cheech? No, in fact, we found no images of rulers at all. Um, it's eight seasons of excavation, no images of leaders. So what have we, have, what have we found then? We found infrastructural investment, um, heavy infrastructural investment um, in social infrastructure, the green infrastructure, and particularly in the hard infrastructure. And here I'm going to try to stick with the with the social infrastructure, but I'll you know occasionally move to you know the others as well, particularly the green infrastructure in this particular talk. Okay, so um, the time range here I'm only going to I'll focus on the middle pre-classic period, which is the period of initial um, urbanization in the actually the Maya area in general, but uh, again, I'll focus here on Paten. But you'll notice that the, the radiocarbon dates include dates before that and, and also after. Uh, before that, the site that I'm going to Nishtun Cheech was actually a pilgrimage center, which is which is kind of important because pilgrimage is sort of a, it, it's another sort of uh, social infrastructure uh, because people are coming in and, and interrelating even though they may, may live elsewhere. Um, and of course, the site was occupied afterwards. As a matter of fact, afterwards, it became a little bit larger. Um, maybe the population probably increased. But again, I'm, I'm going to talk about the time in which it was first um, established as a city. Now, if you, uh, the, the location of the site is located on a peninsula on Lake Petanitsa. It's the largest site, um, well, actually the largest middle pre-classic site on the lake. Actually, Tayasal over here grows larger uh, once you get to the classic period but it, during the middle pre-classic period there was nothing as large as this as this city and um, it um, it seems to be part of some sort of social hierarchy because we see smaller cities that have some ceremonial architecture but not on the scale of Nishtun Cheech all right so it seems to be some sort of capital we don't know actually right now we're trying to investigate the the specific the, the kind of details of that relationship but uh, we're, we're just getting started for that Okay, here's a here's a map of the site. When you first look at this, those of you who are Mayanists, it doesn't look. I mean, there are elements that look very sort of Maya in their their patterning, but the overall layout, the general sort of 
coordination of the city is, is, is not, it doesn't look like a Maya city because most Maya cities are, are, are spread out. This one is all packed together, actually very similar to a modern city. And of course the grid is there. Um, and the grid, um, which I'll talk about in just a second, um, was actually developed probably elsewhere. All right, not it, when we first, we actually for maybe a year or so, we were the earliest gridded site and now we've been sort of displaced by another group. Um, now, one, one element that you'll probably see right away is this central axis. And David was mentioned Broadway and also the, the Street of the Dead at Teotihuacan. Um, our axis is made of buildings and also reservoirs of water. And so, and we, and we think that maybe this, this axis preceded the development of the grid. We're not sure yet because it's hard, you know, <laughs> to get down deep in these buildings, it's really difficult. You can't tunnel because the the, the architecture is too loose. Um, but this is sort of, this is the the basis of organization of this city. Uh, this this ax we call it an axis urbis based upon uh, Roman terminology. And now, if you look at the city and you look at the scale, you know most New Yorkers are going to say that's not a city. That's that's far too small to be the city. And it's it's not, you know, it's not millions of people. And I actually probably only I, I don't really pay a lot of attention to population estimates because they're so difficult to do um, given you know, that cities are, are active, actively constructed and people move in and out and so on. Uh, but I estimate probably 5,000 5, to 8,000 people. Um, so you know, most people would say well, that's not a modern city, but in ancient times when you have that many people living in close contact, that's definitely an urban setting. Um, the site, by the way, those of you interested in, in the Maya, um, it has three ball courts, but most of them are a little bit later than the earliest um, developments. Okay, now here's an image of the grid, and the grid um, is bilaterally, symmetrically organized on top of, actually founded by the, the axis urbis there, so it's almost like a mirror image on each side. And as far as the, um, the social infrastructure goes, um, streets, you know, are, pl are places where people hang out and you can interact, socially interact with other people, whether actively or um, passively. In other words, you can just sort of walk, you know, through the, the crowd and, you know, see other people or you can talk to people. Um, so it is an important place. And this is something actually in modern cities, streets are um, uh, important um, aspects of the social infrastructure. Um, in addition, they provide connections, so they connect, they allow efficient movement between uh, various places, uh, assuming there's, there's not, they're not being regulated. And then finally, they're pilgrimage routes. And I mention this because we do have two main sort of uh, ceremonial, uh, actually there are four, if you, if you don't consider them to be just two streets, I'm just gonna draw on top of this. Oops, that always happens, I don't know why. But the, these streets are much wider than the others, and they also include uh, the artifacts that we found when excavating them, they include massive amounts of ceremonial uh, material. So these appear to be pilgrimage uh, routes into the city. Pilgrimage, again, is really important because it's an, another aspect, or at least facilities for pilgrimage. Uh, it brings people in from the outside. So that's, again, facilitating social interaction. And actually, pilgrimage is an is important sort of source of new, new uh, people for the city. Okay, now as far as the grid goes, okay, as far as the grid goes, it makes the city landscape legible. In other words, actually, when I first moved to New York, I loved it because where I grew up, I could never tell people directions because the, the roads were just winding around. It's hard to give directions. But but in the city, you know, in Manhattan, it has a nice grid there and I, I don't get lost, you know, and, and I can give directions fairly easily. That's one good thing about, about, about grids, they're legible. Another thing, they, they provide crossroads, which, which provide, um, they're, they're highly visible locations. In other words, they're places that you remember, right? Crossroads and also endpoints. Uh, that adds to, to the ability for people to move around in the city. And for the Maya, there's an interesting concept called gush. And what that means is it essentially means soul force. But when, when, when farmers build, this is a modern concept, so we're not sure if we could push it back 2,500 years, but when farmers build fields, they, they build them in a rectangular way and you know, in a gridded pattern to, to establish cush. Now, another thing about this term, which I'm not sure how, you know, I've been kind of investigating this a bit, but it also refers to cooperation. When you cooperate with other people, you, you actually help to tie yourself into this, this sort of larger network of spiritual force. So um, 
you know, it, it has that connotation as well. Okay, I, I do want to mention again for about a year we were the the, the earliest gridded um, settlement, but now Takeshi and Omara up in the middle of Sumasinta area is finding uh, that uh, in fact there there are some that are quite a bit earlier. Ours we probably was established around um, seven to eight hundred BCE. Um, his appeared to be earlier than that. Um, we think probably that the the Actually, there's some some of the layouts in the Sumasinta area seem very similar to that of, of Eastern Chief. So we think that maybe uh, there is some influence going on there. Okay, now the first, besides the roads, I want to mention the pools at the site because I, these are important spaces of the social infrastructure. Now, when you look at this, um, hopefully you can see that this particular pool, which we call fosa, means basically pit um, in Spanish, fosa v is lined up along the, the axis, the axis urbis there. It's part of the, cere the central ceremonial architecture. But the thing about this, this fossa is that it's partially artificial, partially natural. In other words, the water was probably pooling there before, but people put walls up, they put floors in some of them to keep the water in. But again, it's 50-50. It's, it's you, you know, it's not, you know, <laughs> there, there's some of this was going on before people built the city, right? But, but humans sort of, well, well they, they modified the landscape to contain the water so it wouldn't be as you know totally saturated environment. And the thing about the, the site in some areas is really uncanny because after a rain, you know, you'll be standing there and you can actually hear water percolate. It's like flowing under the groundwater flowing under the surface because it's not that deep. And it's it's a very, you know, sometimes it's kind of creepy, but it's it's it, it it's it feels alive. You know, it's it's very different from other sites I've worked on at Patan. Um, but they they understood the groundwater and they were able to capture it. And actually, they did other things with it. They, they some in some cases they sealed it. They they put clay seals on top to keep it from from coming out. But then in other areas they allowed it to come out. Okay, here again, that's Fosa V. Um, here are a couple other um of these pools. When I use the word pool, I'm talking about partially artificial, partially natural uh, pools of water. Notice those are at a right angle, and that's because um the Fosa V is in a, you know along the axis or urbis as is fossa i um there's actually a fourth um which again continues this right angle but it, it, the right angle was not originally developed by the pools we don't think it was developed by the axis urbis and the streets um there is another artificial um uh, pool um in this location and I want to point out, we've, we have excavated that one. Actually, I'll point out the ones that we've excavated here just really quickly. We've excavated this one. This one's FOSA Q. This is FOSA Y. Sorry, my letters aren't very good. And then th this is FOSA I. We've excavated those three, but I'm only going to talk about FOSA Y and FOSA I because of time constraints. Um, but actually, one point I want to mention is we haven't found all of them. Some of them are covered by architecture. And as I mentioned later, these may be, it may have been something that covered the whole site, these, these FOSAs. Okay, here's an image of FOSA Y, which is part of an E group, which I may have time to talk about, although I may save that for another time. Um, it, it's part of a ceremonial group. And so it's actually lined up with the ceremonial group. And this is actually quite common for for these pools of water to be associated with these astronomical group, which is which is what an E group is. Um, inside of this fossa, we actually found that it was completely surrounded by a stadium seating, basically. It's, it's an amphitheater. And so in the base, there was a flat area, and then it was surrounded by the stadium seating. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to excavate in a flat area yet, because but we, we've excavated actually you know, right in front of the stadium seating. We went down six meters didn't hit the bottom. And so it's it before it, this stadium seating was built, it was a pool of water, but they somehow sealed it in so it no longer filled. And uh, on top of this, they threw quite a number of artifacts, actually hundreds, if not thousands. We, you know, we've only excavated three large excavations into this fossa. Um, massive amounts of ceramics, many reconstructable, um, actually chocolate pots, plates, and so on. Then massive amounts of fauna, primarily dog, deer, and uh, turtle, mainly dog. Um, yes, they were their cut marks, cooking marks, and so on. So this is evidence of feasting. Um, the, the big feast was going on in this area, you know. And then they threw everything in, into the pit, 
and and, and terminated all these vessels, as, as you mentioned, um, similar thing that happened at Teotihuacan. Um, we've also found a number of exotic items, such as this this mask fragment. The thing about this is this mask fragment is not this is not Maya. This is this is Olmec, uh, who were occupying the Gulf Coast area at the same time that uh, Nishtun Chich was occupied. So we think that this is another pilgrimage artifact. Um, several other jade artifacts were found as well. Okay, so let's move now to the other fossa. This is the last thing that I'll have time to talk about here. Um, this is Fossa I. It's located next to a ball court. Now, the ball court there, second largest ball court in Mesoamerica. And I know someone's going to say, well, I know one that's bigger. Send me the map. You know, don't, don't tell me. <laughs> Just send me the map because I want to see it. Um, it's fine. But we, we, it, we're fairly certain that during the late pre-classic period, in other words, from around uh, to 300 BCE to AD 200, it was the largest ball court in Mesoamerica. Um, so, but during the middle pre-classic period, we're not sure. I have found some middle pre-classic remains under there, but I'm not sure if it's a ball court yet. Because if you look at it really closely, it's fairly widely spaced. And so if you put a smaller building in there, is it still a ball court? Anyway, these are questions we're going to look at. But we do know that during the middle pre-classic period, Fosa I, the pool of water, was used for ritual purposes, just like what we saw, feasting and, and so on, just like what we saw with Fosa um, Y. So let's take a look at some of the things that we found in there. Uh, again, massive amounts of ceramic uh, remains, although in this case, we, we didn't find a lot of complete vessels. They were just massive amounts of shirts. Um, again, animal remains, um, both uh, feasting refuse and also offerings. We found some deer antlers there with, a, with another part of a cache. So we've got, again, evidence of strong evidence of feasting. In other words, feasting is important because it's, it's a social activity and basically it's sort of a meta social activity because what when you go to a feast you know you interact with other people you meet other people and so you establish new social relationships but at the same time if you don't contribute you know it, it stands out so it's it's a it's you know as far as early, early societies goes it's one of the first um forms of um organized social sort of interaction um another thing we find are roller stamps um particularly in Fosa I, these things were used for bodily decoration. Um, they're frequently found with elites, uh, early elites, not, not people with massive amounts of power, but people with more resources. Um, we're not really sure what they're used for yet. They, some people suggest that they were the precursors of writing. We'll see. Another thing we found in this particular Fosa were a number of ceramic figurines, particularly the heads. And heads are actually quite rare. Usually we find the bodies, but no heads. In Fosa, I, um, we found a massive number of the heads. So this, I guess they're putting them in there for some reason. But but these figurines, this is another thing we don't know what they're used for particularly. We, we think that they're, they could represent ancestors. They could represent, actually, they may be simply an aspect of family ritual that you know is gonna be fleshed out a bit later. They could represent gods. They could represent rulers. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they, these are representations of rulers, but unfortunately they do represent a number of different people. So you know, who knows? They could also represent primordial humans, you know, the, the clay people of, of creation. Um, but but we do find massive numbers of them in this this particular fossa. Okay, so I, I was going to talk a bit about e-groups, but I, I think that 20 minutes is, is enough here. But my main point is that the social, inf social infrastructure adds to our thinking of ancient cities because it allows us to, to imagine how ancient, you know, planners were, you know, designing both the city and social relationships within the city, and also how you know people that lived within the city um, were able to meet and interact and you know exchange items and, and conduct rituals and so on. So that's again, and thank you, David. Um, I just your work has helped us out in, in thinking about Nishu and Cheech. And um, I guess uh, do we open up for questions now? Uh, so David, why don't if if you wouldn't mind, would you uh, take some time to um, to respond to Tim's comments and um, prompts? And then in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to throw them into the chat or even raise your hands, and we can turn on audio. But I certainly want to give David some time to respond. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I, I mean, I find what you're doing there uh, with Prue Rice and others fascinating. Um, it you know, I think as you say, like we have these. Um, bad habits to break of like just these these sort of mental lapses I think that exist in in Mesoamerican archaeology or archaeology more broadly of of thinking of 
you know, for a long time, I've heard people say, well, the grid at Teotihuacan is, is a means of social control. Now, I mean, there are situations where you can imagine that it's, you know, more totalitarian states build grids as some form of control. But I, you know, I think what you're showing and what Takeshi is showing is counter to that. Um, and, it, and, and um, you know, in fact, shows these things about, it, like, issues that you're raising of legibility and um, and and, uh, and and flow of procession or pilgrimage in, into a center are other considerations that we really need to think about it. I mean, just, you know, and just look at the Mediterranean. I mean, we, the most pluralistic or democratic societies uh, were making grids. So I don't understand where that assumption came that they're uh, necessarily a, a tool for control. Now, I mean, it, it varies. The, you know, the Greeks had their cities, the Romans used grids in a more sort of imperial way. But I mean, I think it's important to, to look at um, just the broader context of, you know, what is being used. So for instance, like, is a large pyramid necessarily autocratic control? Like some people argue that for Teotihuacan. So uh, early on, they, they, you know, they built these big pyramids that must be some totalitarian leader. Um, you know, even like the Ur example of, of the pyramids on the Giza Plateau, we've now learned that the, the old models of uh, slave labor are inac inaccurate. Um, there, you know, there's um, laborers, cities or villages right next to the quarries, right next to the pyramids. There's graffiti that indicates that the, the labor teams were, you know, doing the work in a, in a more or less, you know, contented uh, um, way of like, you know, the, the, the friends of Menkere or the drunkards of Khufu and, and things like that. And, um, and you know, they, they were provided for relatively well. And that's, you know, in Egypt, we think of as, as, as a more, at least during dynastic periods, more autocratic, like in uh, Graeber and Wengeru's uh, no, new book, Wengeru, of course, you know, uh, has worked on Egypt and he's more interested in the intermediate periods when things fall apart and become, you know, more decentralized. Um, and so there's been a lot more attention to this and problematizing just these, I think, relatively facile models of large monuments means coercive power. It's like, what was the labor directed towards? If this was a temple that was to a deity that provided uh, rains or fertility or was seen as a, a, a common good, a public good uh, for the city, then that's very different than if it was a dynastic temple where you know a king is saying my ancestors were buried here and they're important and my lineage is important. It's, or a, you know, a palatial structure, right? That's a, just a very different message. So you have to understand the entire context, how it fits within the socio-political organization um, and you know, what was that labor directed towards and who, what, you know, what did the, the individuals who are contributing that labor, what would they have perceived as the benefits and what was their buy-in? Um, I feel like we've often simplified in some of these models the, those complex equations. And so, and you know, that gets a little harder. You notice on the, the uh, two by two graph I had of the following Ostrom, you know, I didn't have things like religious buildings and, and palaces because it's so complex. I mean, you really have to think about how they were organized to, 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 um, to parse them out along those, those different dimensions. But, it, you know, I feel like your work and thinking about the totality of the absence of conspicuous rulers not depicted in art, how that grid functions, the, you know, how um, the city um, uh, developed over time, how it might link to things like Aguada Fenix or other uh, earlier sites where, where Takeshi and team have been working. I think that's really important. That's, that's bringing all these pieces together. Thank you. Um, I had a question for you, <laughs> unless somebody else has a question. Um, when, when, when you, you mentioned that the, the plazas, you know, because a lot of people working in the pre-classic period see their, their, the fact that they have so, so much massive plaza space as being an indicator of a more cooperative, you know, group. And so, and so but now you're, you're suggesting that, in fact, it's, that's not a necessary correlation. Um, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I mean, well, one correlation we see is just the plaza to population ratio over time gets smaller, meaning that, I mean, cities get larger and the, re the relative space to, uh, dedicated to plazas decreases over time. And that's true for um, central Mexico too. So Teotihuacan's plazas are larger than Tenochtitlan's, for instance. Um, and um, 
but and and, and but then Kukulko that comes before Teotihuacan, they're even larger. But so I think it it again needs to get to that issue of what are they doing there? Um, you know, what sort of is it a political spectacle that is more about collective power or, or pluralism or um, you know it. So I mean, just the example of the Agora in Athens as as a as a collective space, a collective open space versus um, you know more autocratic uh, type organization that has large plazas for um, political spectacle. I mean, we think of Red Square or Tiananmen Square or, or something like that in, in 20th century models. So again, I think it's the use. I mean, how are they being used? What is the art and artifacts? that um, are associated with them, what do, what do they tell us about that broader context? I think there's a question. Yeah, a few audience. We do have a question coming in and I also see Nina's hand up, but the question in the chat came in first, so I'm just gonna throw this to that one. It gets us back to the start of the talk actually, and I think it's a great question coming from Kenrick, one of my students, well done Kenrick. Uh, mm -hmm. How can research on the housing infrastructure of Mesoamerican cities be helpful in analyzing the gradual interest in housing co-ops within cities in today's economic world? That's a fascinating one. So um, yeah, I mean, what can we learn from things like the Teotihuacan apartment compounds? Um, uh, you know, they, I, there, there needs to be, I, I would say, like at least our, a lesson from Teotihuacan would be, um, there needs to be some shared sense of purpose for people to be together. Now, in traditional societies, of course, some of that was kinship um, and, and you know, kinship structures, which in our capitalist uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, decentralized or nuclear-based family structure, we don't have as much. We don't have these large-scale corporate kin groups that are really central to our, to our identity. Um, and so we've lost some of that. Um, but so I think Teotihuacan gives you an example of how else it might happen. So, so these you know, large multifamily residences, um, they also seem to have certain patron deities in the household that were favored. I should say there's some evidence, um, this isn't my own work, but bioarchaeologists who studied skeletal remains suggest that um, the uh, apartment compounds were largely patrilocal, meaning women as they married in would take in the residence uh, with their husbands. That's based on shared skeletal traits that seem to be heritable. But in the case of, on the map of the city where I showed people connected with the Gulf of Mexico known as the Merchant's Barrio, there the pattern was switched on its head. Um, local Teotihuacanas were holding down the, the household units um, and men were the, the merchants who were moving between the Gulf of Mexico and up into the mountainous highlands with goods coming from that area. And what I love about this is just it shows like Teotihuacan was a place we think of something like, you know, kinship and whether it's a patrilocal or a matrilocal society as so sort of hardwired and so essential to a society. But at Teotihuacan, if there was this commercial need, um, there was flexibility. And we, we actually see that in some other historical ethnic enclaves where there could be a, a, a switched pattern, where there could be a matrilocal or matrilineal organization in, in a city that's dominant, the opposite um, for, for this economic need. So that's the second possibility. So if there's sort of shared economic goals among a co-op or a, a cooperative living unit, that might be another organizing principle. Um, I mentioned that you know patron deities or there's communal rituals, there's things of, of, of connecting uh, folks with one another. Uh, yeah, just communal labor. I mean, you know, and so that's something I've been thinking about. Like that's really the take home. And um, we don't we don't do it, unfortunately. I mean, we're not, I'm I'm not out there so much. I mean, we're neighbor with our neighbors and uh, here in um, uh, Brookline, Massachusetts. I mean, we have like potlucks and and, and block parties, but there isn't so much of the, the communal labor of like, we're not maintaining the sidewalk collectively, right? And so that, but that was something that if you're maintaining the physical plant of the house, there's chores that everyone's doing. I mean, that would be a way of, of creating buy-in and creating a, a shared, of, a, a sense of shared purpose. Um, so those are some just general lessons that maybe could apply to, to contemporary context. Great, thank you. And I, we now see that Nina has her hand up. Nina, please feel free to unmute. Um, I, I, 
that's interesting what you said about the traders because that was what I was going to ask you about both about migrants and traders. It always seemed to me that another thing that we forget about cities worldwide is they're built by migration. And so I was fascinated by the way you're documenting that David in your data. And, but I also, traders are also moving people that they're mobile. And I wondered if you had been able to find out more about that in terms of um, were there networks of traders? Did they, did they link other cities? Did they link the classes? Did they link the regions? Um, how much were the traders themselves part of these migrating populations? Yeah, those are, are great questions. And um, we have a few different models at Teotihuacan that probably suggest it's variable depending on what the, the um, immigrant communities were. Um, and so, you know, as examples, we have people from Oaxaca, likely Zapotec speakers, um, who resided in the west of the city in what's known as the Oaxaca Barrio or Zapotec Barrio. Um, they seem to have uh, partially assimilated. So they, I mean, they, um, you know, lived in Teotihuacan style structures, um, but their burial patterns were like what you see in, in Oaxaca, not in central Mexico. They had um, effigy vessels of um, their deities, which are related to the central Mexican ones, but different enough that we can tell, okay, this is Coquillo, who's the the, uh, the storm god in, in Oaxaca is different than the central Mexican version of the storm god. They use their own writing system. Um, and uh, likewise, we have Maya hieroglyphs. So this is a polyglot city that, and, and, and actually the people who've worked in, and colleagues who've worked in the Oaxaca Barrio say that some of the, like the, the, the pottery styles they were using, which would link to the capital of Monte Alban um, outside of Oaxaca city today, were in some ways archaic, like that they were preserving patterns of the ancestral homelands that had changed in those homelands. This is a little hard to see archaeologically because we don't sort of have the, the chronology that you might get out of text, but, but this is similar to, um, you know, uh, um, so like Hispanic populations in New Mexico had, had, had uh, um, ways of speaking and, and uh, song styles that uh, were older, that wouldn't exist in Iberia anymore, right? That had, had sort of, they were retaining this cultural identity that in some ways was archaic in the homeland. And that seems to have been the case um, with the Oaxaca Barrio. Um, I gave the example of the, the, um, uh, the, the uh, merchants barrio connected to the Gulf. Where we're working, 45% seem to have migrated from West Mexico, from Michoacan, which is hundreds of miles away, um, but they, you wouldn't be able to tell that except for a few figurines that we have that are in a West Mexican style and the bone isotopes. Um, otherwise, they're living in standard Teotihuacan apartment compounds. They're, the mural styles there, again, look like they do in the center of the site. So that seems to be a really high level of assimilation. Um, so, you know, I would guess, and, you know, this is just extrapolating from those patterns. Oh, and I should finally say we have, you know, the Maya occupation that we know at, at Teotihuacan and one of the projects I worked in in Plaza of the Columns um, documents these, these murals in a, in a very Maya style of those sort of hybrid Teo Maya style that were destroyed. And then we know there were military incursions by Teotihuacan against certain Maya cities, particularly this uh, large one Tikal in Guatemala. Um, and so there, there were very targeted diplomatic relations that probably went, then went sour and um, resulted in in military conflict um, between those polities. So, I mean, it's really like, it's this almost the spectrum of international relations that you could imagine uh, and, and migrant relations. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, it's now actually six minutes past the hour, so we are a bit over time. So thank you everyone for sticking around, especially to our, our two wonderful speakers, Dr. Carvalho and Dr. Pugh. Uh, so for a final vote of thanks, I'm gonna turn things back over to Stephanie Rupp. Stephanie, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, David and Tim, thank you so much for this scintillating talk. It was really interesting to travel back across space and time to visit these ancient cities in um, in Mesoamerica and to do an, a fascinating comparison between um, the sites that you work in. 
Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us for our third lecture in our series on emergent care and community. Um, we'd like collectively to thank David and Timothy for their research on ancient cities and the insights that these places provide into our contemporary lives and urban places and rural places if some folks are not in are not city dwellers. Please join us on Monday, the 31st of January 2022, as we welcome Professor Marjorie Goodwin from UCLA a linguistic anthropologist who will discuss the lived moment to moment practices through which care is realized in interactions within families and communities in the US. Until then, be well, stay safe and healthy and have a wonderful holiday season. Thank you again for joining us tonight.